where do people go within each region from here to help build the hemp economy. Thank you very much for joining us here on the NYHI Network, uh, both you, uh, Henry, and Sally. It's exciting to be able to talk with you guys today and kind of learn more about the projects you're working on, the background that you've had, that you came from, and kind of how you can apply that to the hemp industry and also how to teach new people that are coming into the hemp space, how hemp can benefit them, and also how they can build businesses and potentially reinvent themselves within the hemp space. Uh, so for those that don't know you, could you tell a little bit about who you are, what your background is, and how you came to hemp? Sure. Hi, um, I'm Dr. Sally Warren. I'm a traditional naturopath. I've, I've been um, in the, the health industry, the natural health industry for, for quite some years. I worked um, as um, a traditional naturopath with private clients. I've um, advised people up in Upper East Side, Manhattan. I worked for a high-end um, pharmacy as a as a practitioner. Uh, I also am a, a professor with a distance learning college in natural health, and have been doing that for nine years, I guess. Um, and one of the the reasons that I got into hemp, I started um, selling CBD to uh, to clients and uh, recommending it uh, quite a few years ago, realizing the, the health benefits and looked at uh, actually starting um, our own white labeling business with um, products that, that I had come across that I really liked. Uh, but there are just so many roadblocks in actually making um, a really good living and and really helping people with the product um, and it was it was through the the learning curve that I, that we had because we were both looking at it um, that uh, we started thinking about other aspects of him um, and the 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 other um, side of, of advising people with health issues is that quite often the health issues were caused by their homes, the materials that were used to build their homes, um, the, the, the glues, the fire retardants, all of the chemicals were um, causing major health issues that were really hard to diagnose. Um, but what I was finding is that, that people were actually having to move out of their homes and move from place to place. And each time they found there was, there was something within the home that was, was causing the issues. The, um, having put all the material into the house that we're in currently, I, I can really say, you know, I'm hoping that in the future when we're, we're able to, to invite people over here for an open house, uh, that people can actually experience the, the clean smell, the clean living, the, um, the, the, just the healthy feel of being in a hemp house. So that's basically how I came to it. And um, my partner, Henry, will explain his side. Yes, yeah, so I came to this project and being involved with this aspect of the green economy um, out of need. Um, there are a number of things that came together for me personally. Um, both of us have already raised our, our kids. Uh, she didn't mention her, her daughter. She has two daughters. Uh, one of them is a hairdresser, does an amazing job. Um, we talk about products all the time and ideas. Uh, she has another daughter who is an architect, and we talk about design ideas. Um, I have a, a son who is uh, he's an attorney, and so we talk about uh, social issues and rights. I have a daughter who is a recording artist, and we talk about rights and music industry, et cetera, et cetera. So we both have this expansive network through our kids and through our relationships. I spent the last several years uh, working in Jersey City as a senior project manager with Jersey City and our violence coalition movement, uh, executive director Pam Johnson. Through that work, our focus has basically been giving back to the community, showing a way, solving problems, building collaboration through the work with that team through Sandra Lovely, uh, folks like uh, Frank, Educational Gilmore, et cetera, et cetera. 
um, Steve Campos, there are a whole list of names. Sorry, I can't mention all of them. But there's a network of people out there really trying to do good things in the community. Now, what I realized after we finished the Unity Walk last year, um, that was one of my major projects, is that we need to do better with finance. And so what I said is that instead of you know, going to Trenton or going to the seat of government and begging for money, we need to figure out how to get a piece of the green economy. And then at the same time, I'd have friends invite me to these green events and I'd look around and I'm that, that black guy who's there who looks around, ends up going up to the front and talking to folks and saying, hey, what do you think about the event? I was, this is all right. Well, what, what would you change? I said, well, I'm a little concerned because y'all talk about saving the world, right? But then I look around here, I don't see any diversity. I said, how, how the, sorry for the French, but how the hell are you going to save the world when you got like three and one percenters in here in the room? Now, I'm not, no disrespect, because I know not everybody in the room is three to one percent, but it's a good description because there aren't many people from low resource communities who are, by the way, a majority of the people in the world, right? And so with that said, I figure we have got to fix this. Now, of course, um, immediately got embraced. It's like, yeah, you're right. We agree. So then the puzzle is what next? And what I realized is that there are a lot of people talking about doing stuff with hemp, but not actually doing that much in terms of like hempcrete, right? Now I chose, I was more interested in the building material side because my background is engineering. So Sal and I talked about, I said, you know what? This is before all this COVID stuff, it was like last year. Said, you know what? I think we should um, trust ourselves because we've started businesses before follow spiritual guidance, listen closely, and figure this out. Mm -hmm. And she said, yeah, because she's always been that way. It's like, okay. So we dropped a whole bunch of stuff. I decided I wasn't going to work for another large bank. I'd already kind of moved away from that because of externalities associated with that and said, we have to go and do this separate. That was my beginning. And so what that meant is I used my analysis and engineering skills to figure out how to put all these pieces together because you know, I worked in financial services for a while. I'm the guy who writes algorithms for like wash sales, right? You never see me, but I'm the guy who sells the algorithm to these corporations in the back door, but then they go do their stuff, whatever they do. So I said, you know, if I can figure that out, we can figure this out. So what we figured out is how to get a property that's dilapidated, how to get it financed regardless of credit score, um, how to organize all the logistics to get five pallets of herd delivered, four pallets of lime binder delivered from Lime Works, uh, two pallets of rock wool delivered, lots of wood, et cetera, et cetera. A lot of logistics. That's how I got into it. And so now we're at the point, I'm just show folks a little bit of this. So this is the finished product. This is a hemp creek wall behind us, right? Um, and there's another hemp creek wall there. The entire perimeter of this house is filled with hempcrete. So we use colors. Sally talked about materials. So we actually have hemp curtains. Um, the whole house is basically done with hempcrete. We did some special finishes. We used, we kept the original wood. This house is from the 18, before 1850. Yeah. Um, but we tried to kind of respect the design. So that wall, we redid the plaster, et cetera, et cetera. That's how we got into this. Yeah. That's how I got into this. And, and I, I will point out this this house had been empty for years. Um, it was um, not in a livable state. Um, the the plumbing had all been ripped out. Uh, all the wiring was useless. There was no kitchen, no bathroom. Uh, but we saw a diamond in the rough and uh, we, we went for it. We completely gutted it ourselves, just the two of us. <laughs> Sled, so this is the message to all you folks who have kids yes. out there and trying to figure out what to do. Yeah. Go do demolition, get in shape. Yeah. I'm yeah. serious. Yeah. We demolished, we took the plaster out. We probably took, I don't know, six, three tons of, of stuff out of it. It's about six, six, six tons. Pounds. Yeah, about six easily six tons of material and that's a bag at a time old plaster and lath and uh we just we just went for it and yeah, bagged it because and, it was hard finding help yeah. so we said well we can yeah so we're, one of the things that that we're passionate about is 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 educating 
um, people, especially young, young people out of work who are interested in learning um, how to do this themselves. If, if you can um, work on this and, and um, do it consistently, um, you have a basis for employment because it's so hard to get good help. We hear that everywhere. We actually, we, we employed a, a couple of, of um, young men who we met in our travels. They lasted a day and it was so sad. It was. They, they lasted a day. Less they, they didn't than, know how to put in a good than, day's work. They had no idea. And, and it, it, you know, I'm nearly 65 and I was swinging a sledgehammer and I was bagging um, rubble, I was cleaning um, literally almost waste rubble around the, the place. If I can do it, bless you, bless you, you can do it. Yes, we're both in our you know, 60s and we're so, doing this work. And, and you know what we were explaining to the young people, because we, we, found, we found others um, who lasted various lengths of time, uh, but you're learning a skill. You're not just doing it for, for money at the end of the day. You're learning a skill. And, and you're also learning to show up put and, to, be, and yep. to put a good day's work in and to be consistent. And we were ready to, to give apprenticeships to, um, to, to young, young people. We're still ready to do that. We've done the work now. So. Yes, we'll uh, but we again. want to we want to get another house. We've talked to the mayor. We've we've talked to um, different organisations, and uh, that was prior to COVID. Right now, we're still being asked put together a proposal, and let's talk about buildings. We do drive around sometimes, and we see empty, dilapidated houses that are potential for. Um, a a retrofit, yep. ret retrofit. Now, this this is something that you you can you can look at in all of the states. True. The um, the thing about uh, hemp is that it's it's fire retardant. It, it's um, antimicrobial. It, it's you know all of these good we're things. To the uh, choir we're, there. We're, I know we're preaching to the choir, but this is stuff that you can pitch to your um, community leaders find houses that, that have been empty, dilapidated for years, that have potential. If they've got good um, bone structures, then they, they have potential for this, this amazing material. And, and, and gather together um, youngsters who've been without jobs for years because they don't have the skills necessary, teach them. I, you know, it's it's hard to get a few blisters and and to to get fit, but this is, you know, this this works you out better than any gym, yes. and and at the end of the day, you, we're able to say yes, he apprenticed with us for for six months or whatever, and he did this and he did that and he learned to use a mortar mixer or you know what whatever the skills that were gained. Um, and that, that's our, our, our passion, to, to teach people about the green economy, to get um, uh, people to invest in it. And we've got probably about potentially four different um, investors who are looking for organizations that they, they can trust that, that show um some integrity and and some background and and that they can support and so find it it's out there yeah if i could amplify a, key, a few of those points that are, are key to our business model um so the business model that we've created is basically focused on taking dilapidated properties and restoring them uh, with green materials a prime part of that is hempcrete as, as we're showing here that business model is a self-contained unit in itself. So now that we've just about finished doing some of our write-ups, next month, month of August, we'll put together a, a full presentation 
that talks about the business model. Our intent is to take that on the road and present it in different communities, like one of the first communities. Hey, for I love to. Oh, definitely not. <laughs> no, as oh, with you need COVID, travel, COVID, COVID. Right, we'll sneak in, yes, sneak out. Yes. Do it at night. There we go. Um, yeah. So we'll do it on Zoom or whatever, yeah. right? Yes, we'll, 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 um, we'll be mobile. Um, so we'll present it Zoom. in an idea, like one of the first communities that are targeting, I'll go back to my team in, in Jersey City, is to, to talk through, well, what does it look like? Now, a reason I keep going back to community is because it's very important to bring the community along. And the frustration we had before is that I would ask construction companies, because they're building all these skyscrapers and stuff, right? And I'd ask them, um, yeah, things like the Croson study that was done that basically said, show us your diversity. And then you've got a lot of blah, blah, blah that goes on, or you go talk to someone, and they're so focused on making a lot of money, they will not take a minute to show a young person how to swing a hammer. The young person may have never done the work before. So how do you even get started? I, there are some cool people like, you know, Bill O'Day, he's a freeholder. Um, he would meet me on snowy, rainy days to do a presentation to talk about how a young person can get an apprenticeship program. But we also knew that the unions weren't gonna hire these kids, right? The only ones that would move it forward was my friend Efren who had a solar training company, right? So I said, oh, forget all this. You know, this isn't working. But see, by us doing it ourselves, we can create our own apprenticeship program. So here's the point. For every community from coast to coast, uh, what we're inviting you to do when we share this business model is to look in your community for a dilapidated property. One that's been abandoned, one that you can you know, come together with, figure out how to get financed, we'll help people through that part. And then the intent is when it's done is not to make a million dollars on, you know, sell it to rich people. Not, nothing against rich folks, but the people getting pushed out of communities. So the intent is how do you, um, you can sell it to whoever you want, right? You just have to get them ready to qualify for the loan. That's all. So that's what we'll be talking about. So then how do you reinvest that property back into the community? So see, that's the model, get paid. right? That's the model that we're, we're developing mm -hmm. so that everyone gets paid, everyone's made whole, there's mutual benefit. And then the related part of this mm -hmm. is we recognize this industry is in its infancy. And so um, there are needs across the board. Mm -hmm. So for folks looking to reinvent themselves, what we're going to be focusing on is getting a decortication facility, looking through financing, talking with Delgado's office, the mayor's office, et cetera, et cetera, to figure out how to get that done. Um, once, not even once that's done, but as that's developing, what we'll also be doing is talking with people who are trying to figure out how to do business mm -hmm. because there's value in making like hemp masks for protecting against COVID, you know, shower curtains, all kinds of different stuff, products and materials. So why not get started with those so we can develop economies of exchange? Because if you think about the fundamentals of a market, right, the market is typically the center of a community. If you're not careful and you're sending, you're going to go broke. But if you can figure out how to send it to your friend, your friend sends it back to you. In other words, you're exchanging goods and services. Somebody's growing food, somebody's making growing, bread, somebody else is doing some with fabric. You're, you're but you can create yeah. a local economy yeah. where you may not have a million dollars in the bank, but you're living like a millionaire. Absolutely, yeah. No, it's uh, set, setting up, uh, as opposed to buying stuff from another country or something and importing it, and then having all that money go, go elsewhere, you can, you can have it kind of stay within, within the community. Uh, and then also uh, the, as you said, like bringing the community members in, whether they're the construction workers or they're the bank that's local or they're, I mean, as you mentioned, uh, we were talking before with the hardware company, right? Uh, just bringing all these different members in so that they have, they have a, a touch point on it, right? So they can feel more comfortable with it uh, is, is very important. And so could you actually uh, kind of expand, uh, you talked about how you had to bring in all these different materials and all the different kind of puzzles you had, you had to solve. Like what, what were some of those puzzles and, and what were some of the solutions? So as part of this, it's very important to build local community and to collaborate. So collaboration is a strength and it's a key. Um, because there's the idea is if you're not careful and you're spending money with just big corporations, if you look at the corporation's balance sheet, those folks on the board are likely not in your community. They're sending it someplace else, or they're sitting on it, or they're playing games in the stock market, moving it back and forth while your boat is sunk into mud, right? But if you work with local people, right, everyone can benefit as long as everybody's adding value. That's the power of it. So what we did is we said, okay, we're going to find the local folks. So we went to 
local savings and loan in, in Ulster County and met the bank manager, opened our account there, right? Great organization, Bank of Green County. Um, and then they offered to introduce us to a bunch of folks. We haven't even followed up on that. The puzzle, the major puzzle was going to be logistics of delivering tons of material by pallet because I realized that we needed to get material delivered by pallet and we didn't have room on the property if it was on a regular street to have all that stuff sitting outside or you yeah. know, that. So what ended up happening is met with um, one of the managers at Herzog's, that's one of the local hardware stores. And um, we worked through an arrangement where we ordered some materials through them and they were able to hold some of it for us, right? So literally it was so amazing. We could have a whole pallet or four pallets of lime binder delivered from uh, Pennsylvania from Limeworks. Yeah, so, and they would hold on to mm, it and then we could contact them and say, hey, listen, we're ready for another pallet of the lime binder. Can you deliver it? Sure. What time do you want? And so for about 35 bucks, uh, a truck shows up in front of your house with a forklift. Now, see, I know friends who've had to unload, um, you know, 20, 40 bales of stuff at a time by hand. Yeah. Yes. Right? Literally. It's literally. a wonder to yeah. have a forklift just come and drop it in the front yard. For 35 bucks. It right. was just amazing. So the, the, the key point with this local um, hardware store is that they didn't carry any of those materials. They were open. They, yep. were, they were absolutely generous and supportive of our, our project. Um, in a, allowing us to order products that they didn't carry through mm -hmm. them mm -hmm. and, and to get it delivered. So uh, that, was, that was awesome. So if you have um, a relationship with these local companies, they will bend over backwards to help you. Yeah, be fair to them, be fair to buy them. through we, them, we take buy, your business to them. We have bought and we will continue to buy um, tons and tons of stuff through them. And, and we, we formed a relationship that allowed them to have products that they don't normally carry um, delivered there in their, their, their warehouse, which was just exactly. phenomenal. Because we were trying to figure out if we got um, a container load of, um, of herd from France delivered over and then it arrived, they said we we would need a crane. So I was starting to price up cranes and, and yep. well, can we, can we just tip the thing and make it slide off? <laughs> um, and where would we slide it off to anyway? Because this is a residential street. Cause you know, when you're, you're redoing dilapidated homes, they're on residential streets mostly. Um, and so we found a farm that we could have delivered right. it Seed to. Seedstock farm, we want to thank the folks out there. Yeah. They had actually agreed, we're, gonna, we're still going to do some work with them, do some training, but they've got like hundreds of acres, right, of space and tents. Mm -hmm. So that was another possibility. So again, collaboration is you have to leave home at times to get yeah. on the phone and meet people. Uh, so we met people um, and with a positive attitude. We talked with them about possibilities and mutual exchange, mutual benefit. Mm -hmm. Those are a couple puzzles. Does yeah, that answer so the question? <laughs> Hilarious! It was absolutely hilarious. Just trying to to wrap our minds around, you know, if if we're buying from far away, I bless them. I I talked to a, um, a several Canadian companies, and we were figuring out how to truck herd from Canada and what that would cost and what the 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 repercussions of receiving all of this material here would be like. And uh, you know, it it was just. It's so ridiculous. I should add one more thing because uh, before this call, I had a uh, talk with my friend Jeff, mm -hmm. and they're they're working on a, a bid, and uh, we we're going over some of the numbers, you know, the materials. And uh, one of the things I shared with them, which I think is important for this kind of conversation, is as people go out to solve these puzzles and build these networks, uh, one does not have to be all things in all scenarios, right? it's good to team up and allow some to become specialists by region and form networks because that's where the real power starts growing is as we build trust-based networks. Here's what I mean. Um, I know they're gonna be looking for herd and looking for line binder, et cetera. So what I suggested to them is talk to my friend Cameron, right? Because we work with him and he's now at the point where he's ordering containers because see someone has to do 
the, the palletization and the containerization of the orders. Otherwise, what happens is you create a lot of noise out there. You get five different people from several different regions and several area calling the same people and each of them ordering a fragment here and there. Then somebody has to figure out how to put it all together. It's a little easier if we build our own networks and you decide what your network is for a geographic area. So in this case, I told them, let's go to Cameron because we can probably get a better price through him because he's already batching some orders. And so what can happen in the future since he has the relationships? Because if you don't have the relationships, your stuff's going to get delayed. So instead of ordering a container next time, maybe you'll order two because maybe 75% um, on 100% of the first is spoken for in the next three months and 25% of the second is spoken for. And yeah, that's what we have to get to to get supply until we get the coordination. There just isn't enough hemp fiber here and hemp, hemp herd here. And for the it's, opportunity it's to grow. For the opportunity to grow. So it's a chicken and egg situation constantly that we're, we're coming across. And um, please grow more him, please. Yeah, and, and you can probably see, so for some of you listening yeah. out there, because see, there are a lot of different people that are gonna be listening to this. You never know who's gonna listen. But um, imagine this, we are all building a supply chain. Mm -hmm. And so the question to ask oneself is, what is my role in my local part of the supply chain? And what's a reasonable, reasonable way for how this thing is going to get connected together? So if you think that thought, then what will tend to happen is you'll ask different questions when you go out there to start looking for your materials and how you um, plug in to help. Not only that, but we collectively can come together and imagine new ways of doing this. So let's say, for example, construction. Now, for those of you in construction, you know that most contractors, they have about that much time to do research, right? They put in the bid, they get to work, they get the team, guys don't show up, they gotta find somebody, boom, 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 right? Mm -hmm. They don't have time to do research. So what we have to figure out how to do is deliver it to them on a silver platter. So we have to think through, if you want to get hemp into a large scale industrial project, you have to be ready to deliver at an industrial scale. And the guys that show up on the forklift, they don't give a damn about most of this stuff, right? They're getting paid, they're doing their job. Yeah, yeah. They wanna know where to pick it up, where to put where it to down, it right? They don't wanna sit and yak. Yeah. So knowing that, the idea is we have to figure out the details like, okay, you know what? Those guys over there, they're not going to be cutting open a bag at a time to you know, put the stuff in here and blah, blah, blah. So we have to figure out how to get to super sacks. We have to figure out how to get to mixing and delivery systems, et cetera, et cetera. So for those of you out here, out there who know how to do those kind of things, we collectively need to figure that out and choose the best practices by region so it can scale up faster. Absolutely. Yeah, no, it's, it's definitely very important that, uh, I mean, I feel like it's, it's happening less now, but at the beginning, everybody was trying to get in and be everything all at once. Uh, but that's really not the smart thing to do, right? It's, it's t take maybe the expertise you have now in a different field and apply it to hemp, right? Whether you're in the finance world, whether you're in the construction world, whatever it might be. And then also, as you said, like, we have to build out that, that whole supply chain, right? Because it's, it's very important to have each step kind of laid out and, and kind of what you were saying earlier in terms of the aspect of going to these green uh, project events and seeing that people are kind of laying out, this is the dream plan of this is what it will look like when it's finished, but not necessarily laying out, this is all the steps it'll take to get to that point and this is all the things we have to solve to get to that point because that's very important because if you don't do that, nothing is going to happen right and that's that's like that's the biggest part of the research jake you can talk all day about the successful company you're going to build and and how great it's going to be in the world but if you don't know how you're going to actually start it and how you're going to build each component of it it's not really going to go anywhere and so um are, are some like the with the decortication project you're looking at is that kind of the primary goal of it and that you're looking at you're trying to figure out okay well if we get a decortication set up what are all the steps that kind of go around that can you kind of expand on what that project is looking at and, and go into there well the the decortication center um locally is um uh, something that we came up with last year when when we came across all the the um project issues, the steps that we had to, to go through in order to, to just get started. And um, when we realized that there was no decortication centers, and we thought, well, that, that just does, does not compute, you know, because we were totally sold on, on the, 
the um, the idea of retrofitting with with hempcrete. Everybody we talked to was excited about it. Then finding the material was difficult to say the least. But just the the knowing how much hemp is being grown now, but there are no centers, was again like it just doesn't not compute. So. We, uh, we looked into the different uh, decortication um, equipment that, that was out there, and it, it still seemed... Field-based decortication. Exactly. And, and, and so looking at, well, seeing the, the steps that we would have to do just to have the herd delivered, why not look at, at a, a center that we could actually have the plants delivered to and decorticate on site. Um, so we started talking to, to various people, the mayor and, and the local representative, and they were so excited. Um, but then COVID happened, but you know. Um, so now we're talking to other, other um, groups who are actually putting together decortication centers as well. So our, our idea is still very alive and, and relevant. We, we're still doing the research. We want um, to go to some decortication centers, so at least we know what they, what they do and what they look like and, and all the rest of it, rather than just you know, buying a nice pretty machine on, on, online for a million bucks uh, and then try to figure it out when it, when it arrives. It's a bit like going to Ikea and buying the whole kitchen. <laughs> True. Uh, but yeah. anyway, that, that's, that's the, the background to it. Uh, we've been around, there, there are empty warehouses here. Um, it's, it's again, looking to see what we, we can revive, uh, bringing jobs to the area. So um, important for now when we've got such a high unemployment rate. But, you know, you can't just put a job ad on in the newspaper and say, looking for a decortication center manager who actually knows what a decortication center is and thinking that we'll get a lot of applicants. So no, we have to educate ourselves. We have to talk to people who are actually doing it. Um, and we, we welcome anybody to contact us on, on that. And uh, we're, we're off to the races. Yep. So as, as part of our, our, our mission, um, and to your point, we recognize that it's important to have key components in your supply chain. So for example, if you look at the current landscape in the United States, uh, you have scenarios where people are growing primarily for flour and for CBD. Now, the stocks quite often are left in the field. Um, and if you hear about decortication, in most cases what we found, um, there are a few places that they're actually building out centers, but a majority of the videos you see out there on YouTube and the, the pitches are field-based decortication, which is not what we're talking about. Because we looked at those, we actually almost thought about getting something, but I did the math on it and said, no, this makes no sense at all. We're not gonna be standing out. And we have friends who are growing product, right? So there are plenty of farmers who are growing for flour, and we were just going to go get some stock and see what it was going to take. But we'd done enough research to know that, no, we're not going to get bundles of stock over to a uh, Song farm by truck that we'd have to organize ourselves and then put it into a machine for it to come out the other end. But I tell you what, now that we've been through what we've been through, if we knew that we were going to spend, let's say, $3,000 on some product, I would bet you if you told someone far enough in advance that you would give them $3,000 if they could deliver to you some dry prepared herd, they'd figure it out. So that's what we're seeing. Now the point is that we really want to get the cost down, right? So you kind of flip the script, you see how much you pay the current cost of the market to ship it across an ocean, and then you do the math locally to see what it would take to take it from the local fields, get it to a central location, and use your best practice for decorticating it, separating the herd and the fiber, and getting good quality of herd and what that would take, you know, bagging it in a super sex, et cetera. We see that as um, 
a way forward and an overall benefit. And we see it as a learning experience. So we're gonna position as a research project because let's not kid ourselves. Uh, no one knows, right? Um, you don't know what's gonna happen until you flip the switch on. See, as an engineer, I know that because I've had uh, labs where you're supposed to connect a generator, no, a motor to a generator. And you connect the electric motor to a panel that has like, you know, 50 amp circuits with big fat wires. Sounds good until you turn it on and then you see what happens. So at some point you have to try it. So that's the point. We're gonna try it. Like Sally said, um, Kingston's unique in its location because of the highway access, uh, proximity to large cities, uh, shipping channels. What's generated, they, they used to provide ice to New York, for example, because they could put it on a barge and send it down. Trains run through here. Um, and there are large vacant warehouses. So the next step that we have to figure out um, is one of the tasks that I have is to, to um, get a spec for what the machine's going to need in terms of power, uh, space, uh, cooling, uh, warehouse space, truck access. So we're, we're, working, we're working with a team to work up um, a profile for that. So maybe another thing, the power of networking is that for those of you out there who are on a similar path, reach out to Hemp Industries Association um, and figure out who is working on this in your area so we can compare notes and best practices because we're all in this together and we'll share with you what we're learning if you share with us what you're learning so we can put together a good um, template for what's needed for the cortication facilities so we can do good consideration. Here's an example. If you get it wrong and you choose a, a facility that has like dodgy power, for example, now you've got a whole new issue because you're dependent on power to run your facility. If you get it wrong because of logistics and transportation, there's a whole set of issues. If you get it wrong because of uh, the types of things you want to do there, like let's say you want to support ancillary um, business that's considered to be chemical. See, now you've got a whole new issue because some people might say, well, we don't want chemicals and blah, blah, blah. If, you can if we can figure out all of the boxes that need to be checked and research them up front, then all of us stand a better chance of being successful at getting our regional decortication facilities up and running for the first year. Right? Just, just get it up and running for the first year and then figure it out after that. Absolutely, our yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's, it's very important because, as, as you said, there's there really isn't any facility out there. I mean, you, we could potentially import a small piece of machinery from China or something that you're still going still gonna to have to hand feed it. And that it works on an experimental level, but it doesn't really work when you're trying to scale something up and actually, like, get, as you said, get that price down. Because, uh, at, like, even though we can sell the green aspects of it, we can sell the helping of the farmers, we can sell the helping of the community the economics still plays a major role in, in actually getting uh, these materials into somebody else's hands to actually develop, whether it's a hempcrete house or a plastic product or whatever it might be, right? The economics has to kind of match it. Either it has to be superior in its in its uh, technical factors, whether it's strength or uh, durability or whatever it might be, or it has to match uh, economic factors, right? And so, or be below. That's, that's quite a challenge. I just uh, was thinking about this as you're talking because you're, you're a younger man. And um, as, as a, an older person, uh, one of the dilemmas that um, I, I see, because I, I experienced Silicon Valley, right? Starting from its infancy, I, I saw the whole thing. It went from Valley Parts of Delight in San Jose, California, where it was orchards, to wafer fabrication facilities. So I have a brother who still works for Applied Materials and they're doing amazing stuff, right? But what happened is um, a lot of those folks that you know, I met back then, an environment they came from, some of them um, worked on cars, for example. You'd have times in San Jose where you'd have low riders and things like that. See, don't, don't put it down because those guys figure out how to hop cars. You know how they did it? The guys who were fastest, most successful at it, they had friends who worked in the hills who had tractors. And what they knew is instead of having electric hydraulic pumps for the hydraulics in the car, they could get um, a mechanically fed hydraulic pump from a tractor, put it on their car because they had a, a, a auto shop class and a welding class and they work with their hands and they could put the pieces together, right? And so now you got all this amazing stuff. See, that kind of uh, hands-on approach is necessary. And the, the challenge we have right now is we have, a, unfortunately, a generation of folks who may not have had 
the benefit of working with real things with their mm -hmm. hands. They might be used to like pushing a button and they expect something to happen. <laughs> like they might be surprised and know that I look at Facebook and I think it's crap. Zuckerberg, I'm just saying it's a crap piece of software. You got it going, I'm happy for you and all that, but so many things just don't make sense, right? There's a lot of software out there like that. Young people are used to that, but real things, they don't just explain themselves. You literally have to start, look at it, and figure it out, mm -hmm. figure out the puzzle. So people can talk about it with fancy PowerPoints all they want, and we, we've got to figure out how to inspire people to put the PowerPoint away, mm -hmm. right? Just put it away. Mm -hmm. Okay, come over to the warehouse, uh, go take some classes on power, and then figure out, you know, work with a qualified electrician to get the space wired. You know, real, just really practical, down-to-earth kind of stuff. Um, you only have to do a little bit of it, and then a whole door opens. Yeah, the decodication uh, machines that, that we have heard, uh, and we've talked to, to people that we have heard about, have generally been modified. Um, they're, they're often the, the, the basic Chinese um, machine, but completely modified to be able to cope with the gumminess, to be able to cope with um, a consistent- Stock diameter. Right? Yeah, stock diameters, um, to, to keep working for one thing. Um, and the, the, the guy I was talking with in, in Canada, they're using a, a Chinese machine that, that has been completely um, reworked and, and modified and there's um, another um, friend a uh, person that we heard about through through Cameron his is a machine that he's completely modified so we know that people are, are making it happen by um, getting a machine and 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 figuring it out adding things that that actually help production uh, we have not heard of one that is literally off the um, the shelf or whatever that that you just put in into your warehouse and and it makes it go. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it I'm, makes I'm it on work. Safety committee, so I'm hold this for a second. <laughs> yeah, no, you're right. Um, and the point she's getting at is that as part of learning to work with our hands, mm -hmm. um, that there, I see a collaboration opportunity right between generations, like this area for example, was um, a location where decades ago, there's an IBM facility. Now, what that meant is that, like some of the silk parts of Silicon Valley, um, they started from the basics and did everything. Because see, in Silicon Valley, I worked in sheet metal fabrication, right? That's where you put the big sheets on the metal, it punches holes in, you bend it, you do all this stuff. You got, you know, forges where stuff gets poured. There are people around who know how to do that, and some of them are sitting at home. So an opportunity is for a young person who needs to solve a tough problem, like you look at a decortication machine and you imagine maybe a piece that has to get fixed. So this is to or the modified. network. Yeah, or modified. modified. So this is a network. Yeah. Young people, you know some of the new tech that's out there where you can uh, laser print certain parts, right? So there are opportunities to figure out how to set up service models where you can get the specs for old things and put it into the new data format that's needed mm -hmm. for the digital printer so you can have um, low volume production of some replacement parts that are needed to fix some old mm -hmm. machines. And then the second part of it is, uh, plenty of the young people know that there are uh, sophisticated tools that are way beyond AutoCAD that you can use for redesigning things and simulating things. And then you can take that and send it off for um, to press or to build and get a new part back. So there is an opportunity for all of us to, to collaborate to solve some of these mm -hmm. puzzles, take our best science and figure out the best Experience. method at the lowest price yeah. to, to modify the machine that she's talking about that has to be modified to make it more efficient and productive. Yeah, absolutely. It's, uh, I mean, again, uh, A, the hands-on factor is majorly important. I mean, as, as I was t uh, telling you guys earlier, I did uh, two years of growing fiber hemp. We grow about 15 acres each year. And just like putting the seed in the ground and kind of better understanding, A, what does it mean to really be a farmer, right? Which incredibly challenging life for sure. Uh, but then also like, uh, what does it like really take to actually grow this plant? Because I mean, you can read as many research papers as you want, but that's only going to give you so much knowledge before you actually like put hands to hands to work, right? 
Uh, and then also the aspect that you said of bringing people that have expertise in other fields that aren't necessarily hemp people, right? They're, they're, they have expertise from other areas and applying it to the hemp industry because that's really what's going to drive us forward is we don't want to try to reinvent the wheel in every single category. We want to take people that already know what they're doing and have them come work with us to, to better further our own projects, right? And then also further their own their own understanding of what's going on, because then now we can apply it to the hemp material, whether it's, I mean, again, making like plastics or doing the hemp green, all that kind of stuff, like bringing people's knowledge base from elsewhere and, and they can learn even more, but then we can also uh, benefit from, from their original knowledge. Um, as much as I want to continue this conversation, we do need to somewhat wrap up. But uh, for though, uh, for those that maybe want to reach out to you, how can they contact you? And then also, uh, what are some last bits of uh, advice you'd give to somebody that's trying to get into the hemp space? So you can reach me uh, by email, Henry, H-E-N-R-Y, build green, Henry build green at gmail.com. Uh, so you can uh, send email uh, to that address. Um, you can also check our website. We'll start updating it next month. Well, yeah. um, it's basically buildgreennow.net. Mm -hmm. uh, so you can look at some content there and we'll start putting up forms and we'll talk about the project uh, here. And what we'll also do is reach out to the Hemp Industries Association. We'll look for whatever webinar or seminar series that you have planned. Um, so we can send some information to you if you want to post it and add it to this, because I think uh, the the question that will stay on the table is, is where do we go from here? You know, so people have heard a lot and where do people go within each region from here to help build the hemp economy? Absolutely. Cool. Very cool. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for joining us and uh, we'll, we'll have to do this again soon. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for joining us here on the NYHI Network. If you enjoyed what you heard and you'd like to hear more, please consider smashing that like button below and subscribing to our channel if you haven't already. If you'd like to become a part of the Hemp Industries Association and help the hemp industries grow here in the United States, please consider joining the HIA at joinhemp.org. If you want to become a part of the New York State chapter or the NYHIA, please check off the chapter box next to New York when you go through sign up. Thank you very much for joining us and have a wonderful day.